Hey, Matt. Hey, guys. Welcome to the State Department. Happy Thursday. Uh, <coughs> I don't have anything at the top, uh, except for one thing I did notice, or I'm getting a lot of questions, uh, and I've seen uh, some commentary on uh, uh, social media uh, about uh, what may or may not be happening in the corridor just outside the briefing room. I just wanted to assuage any uh, um, uh, conspiracy-minded uh, uh, folks uh, that the PA Bureau is undergoing uh, a renovation of its office space. It's a long planned project. It's overseen by the Bureau of Administration's Real Property Management Office, uh, which manages all domestic uh, uh, State Department property. <clears throat> That includes in this building. Uh, they are taking every necessary precaution uh, to ensure that the asbestos, abate, asbestos abatement is done according to environmental safety standards. And that does include uh, having to temporarily remove the uh, portraits of uh, the legions of previous spokespeople that have graced this podium before me. Uh, but I can assure you that they will be restored in all their glory. Uh, they're not being uh, consigned to the trash heap of history um, and look it's really for you all to lobby but uh, you know I, granted I've only been acting spokesman but uh, you know I have briefed up here I think more than any other spokesperson in history with possible exception of voucher uh, with that a little self aggrandizement I will turn it over to you Matt Lee well I just want to make sure that the asbestos situation is going to be under control. We're not going to be quarantined. Or no, I, I, I can assure you it won't be, but it's the reason why they have to put up those scary uh, warnings. Anyway, uh, what's up? Uh, all right, and when the new photos go back, uh, well, when the old photos go back up, will there be a, a, a new one? Uh, I have nothing to announce at this time. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to get a, I know a you are. just get a, I know a, you are. an, an will, on the record we will response to informed, uh, whether or not this is the last, your, uh, your my last, last briefing. briefing. I never say never, um, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll withhold on that. Okay. Uh, and I'll I'll send out commentary later if it does turn out to be my last <laughs> briefing. No, uh, just kidding. Well, anyway. no, because if Thanks. you're not going to get away with not having some words said about you. Thank you. Appreciate uh, it. When that does happen. Anyway, let's start with uh, real news. Yeah. Um, on Russia, yes, uh, I wanted to clear up one logistical thing and then uh, ask a uh, policy type thing. One, uh, the logistical thing is. To the best of your knowledge, was there ever any indication that uh, over the course of the last week that uh, the secretary's meeting with uh, President Putin would not happen? So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was there, sorry, let me make sure I got the question right. Was there ever any indication that it would not happen? So routinely, um, and I think others opined on this yesterday, it is the case that the president will see uh, a visiting secretary of state, and it's been the case in the past. Um, it's also pretty routine that they're not formally announced until uh, uh, the day of or even hours before. Uh, and that's ultimately something for the Kremlin and President Putin himself to announce, uh, which is part of the reason why we were being mum on it. Uh, I think it's something we expected all along and, and we're planning on. Uh, but, but did you ever get any indication from the Russians that the meeting might be off? Uh, we were never given any indication that there, uh, that there might not be a meeting yet. And, and then there, there seemed Sorry. to be a line of commentary that, for, that, that Secretary Tillerson had been kept waiting by uh, President Putin. The meeting, I believe, was scheduled and had been long scheduled for 5.30 local time. Um, and the, the way I understood it, the Secretary was running about half an hour late after his meetings with the foreign minister. <laughs> So the meeting began less than a half an hour after it was, or about a half an hour after it was supposed to have been. I can assure you he was correct? not. I, I double checked on this, and he was not kept waiting. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now on yeah, the sure. onto the uh, substance. The sure. um, secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov both announced that they would be creating working groups. I think. For Mr. Lavrov used the word special <coughs> envoys, but I don't know if that was a translation issue or not. But let's say working groups to look at various irritants and see how they look. Can you be more specific about what those areas are that these working groups, or if it's just not, if it's just one working group, what, what what it will be looking at and what you hope to achieve? So a couple thoughts on that. I, and I, if I'm shy on specifics, I apologize. But um, first of all. 
um, both in his bilateral meeting, but also in his uh, meeting with, uh, sorry, with his, in his bilateral meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, but also in his uh, bilateral with President Putin, uh, um, there was, uh, I think, uh, an acknowledgement uh, that uh, there are uh, almost historic low level of trust, uh, uh, levels of trust uh, between uh, our two countries. And I think Secretary Tillerson said right out of the bat in his press avail yesterday, that's a problem. Um, I think it is certainly in his meeting with President Putin, um, they went over uh, the history of why we're, at, why we're where we're at. Um, and I think it allowed the two of them to uh, both appreciate and better understand uh, why uh, each country is uh, frustrated uh, with the other on certain issues. Um, and I think by the end of that, they were able to acknowledge that uh, with this understanding in place, there's a way for um, the two countries to find ways to rebuild uh, some of that trust, find opportunities. Um, and with that respect, I think that's, you know, the idea of this working group is to look at, uh, look for those opportunities uh, or ways to kind of rebuild so it's a trust. Singular. It's not um, multiple. It, it, to my, my understanding, it is, it is a singular uh, okay. group at this point. Um, and and um, sorry, just in terms of the working group's mandate, it's still being worked out, the exact details. Um, um, there's been some speculation this is kind of a return to the bilateral presidential commission. That's not the case. Uh, but I think this is a, a group that's going to focus on looking at some of these irritants and looking at ways that we can possibly find opportunities. When you say it. mandate is being looked at, does that include the membership of it? Uh, like who, I believe who, so. Who would yeah, be on it? Who will be on it? All right. Yes. And then you said that they went over the history of why we're at where we're at. This was this like an air, the airing of grievances or something? I don't. I mean, how far back did they go? I, I, do, I don't know. To, <laughs> I was told a short history. I, I don't know. Uh, look, I think um, uh, I, I think it was helpful to hear uh, for both sides to hear each other's perspective on why we're where we're at. I mean, none of this is going to come as news as anybody in this room who's followed uh, how we've gotten to where we are. But I think it's important. Uh, in any kind of bilateral situation like that, uh, to hear the other side's point of view. Uh, he did that, uh, Secretary Tillerson, and uh, again, it's part of a, a, an effort to appreciate uh, uh, their perspective. It's not one we agree on, uh, but it helps us understand so that we can find a way to work forward. Right, but I mean, is the idea that they would focus on smaller issues or, uh, of, and not huge <laughs> differences like Syria or NATO expansion or I wouldn't even I, I wouldn't necessarily even qualify it that way. I think they're looking at um, where we can find common ground. I mean, look, even out of Syria, there was the common ground that they found that you know we all agreed to what end state we want to see in Syria, which is a Syria whole uh, uh, and uh, and um, uh, uh, with all uh, religious groups and, and minorities represented. Yeah, but it's how we get there. That's a difficult. I get it. That's a difficult yeah, challenge. That's been, the common, that's been the common goal since Geneva won. You're right. Yeah. And but it's the getting there that's difficult. But right. I think so. It's, what's the point of agreeing to something that you previously agreed to? And then, to, I mean, I just uh, was there any? If there's no progress on the means to get to the end, then I don't understand what, why it's so productive to, you know, <coughs> uh, for the two sides to run down a list of what pisses that you off about the other side. I, I, don't, I don't get it. Well, I think, again, I'll just say as part of this effort to find common ground, uh, find areas of cooperation, not common ground, but areas of cooperation, uh, there was uh, a good faith effort for each other to uh, listen to the other's uh, grievances. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, um, just to come back, so you don't know when the working group is going to start? I, I guess that. If we get more on that, I will, I'll let you know, but I, I, I think it's TBD. Okay. Um, and I know this, um, was there maybe um, a discussion about a follow up meeting between the two? Between Lavrov, Lavrov and, 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 uh, and the secretary? Uh, secretary Tillerson. Um, Are you aware of anything? I'm not aware of any physical meeting. Of course, they'll uh, obviously follow up on, by phone, I expect. Uh, nothing to announce in that regard, too, but uh, I have no. Uh, expectation yet of, uh, of a follow-up meeting. Do you, um, you probably saw that the AFP had um, an interview today with um, uh, Assad, um, who, who called it, um, who called the, the accusations of a chemical attack um, a fabrication. <coughs> you saw earlier this morning the Syrian army statement, which the U.S. then hit down, um, saying that the, the U.S. Uh, airstrikes against ISIS had hit uh, <coughs> 
a chemical <coughs> weapons me. depot um, uh, by ISIS. What, what's going on here? Day after these meetings, um, there seems to be pushback. This doesn't look like somebody who looks like he's about to um, change course. Well, it's uh, sadly, it's vintage Assad. Um, it, it is uh, an attempt by him to uh, throw up false flags, um, create confusion. Um, uh, frankly, it's a tactic we've seen uh, on Russia's part as well in the past. Um, there can be little doubt that the recent attacks and the chemical weapons attack in, uh, in Idlib was uh, by the Syrian government, by the Syrian regime, uh, and that it wasn't only a violation of uh, the laws of war, but it was, uh, we believe, a war crime. Mark, I just want to follow up on yep. Before that, I want to ask you about Russia. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the president said that, uh, you know, basically sort of toned down the rhetoric, and he said that uh, ultimately everybody will come. The president. The president the, Putin. The pre no, the president oh, of the United States, President, president Trump, Trump, said oh, that, uh, you know, everybody will come back to their senses and they were going to have better relations and so on. Is that a result of the conversation between Secretary Tillerson and, and the president? Uh, is that the outcome? Because that, that, you know, a bit down or more hopeful about the future relations with Russia than it was yesterday. <coughs> well, certainly I'll let the President's tweet uh, stand for itself. Um, I, I just say that, you know, the President also made this point in his uh, um, uh, press avail with the uh, NATO Secretary General yesterday. And, and it's simply that, um, you know, the world is a uh, complicated and difficult place and, and there's enough hard challenges out there uh, that we would uh, uh, like to be able to have a constructive uh, relationship uh, with Russia, but we're not there. Um, and I think, but I think our ultimate goal is to find, as I said, areas small uh, at start, but areas where we can rebuild that trust uh, that's sorely lacking. And on, on uh, the asset interview, now you keep saying that uh, you have irrefutable <coughs> evidence. I mean, today the United States is saying that they intercepted some communications between the pilot and some chemical scientist and so on on how to do this. I mean, that is, seems to be the evidence. I find that difficult, I mean, or, you know, is it uh, a bit odd that the pilot would be talking to whoever the scientists are and so on to drop this bomb? Is that the only I'm not aware of that have? report. Uh, but that, I, that, that, what I know, am that, sure. That's what CNN said because what I, sure. they were told by, a, you know, a high official and so on. Well, what mm -hmm. I am aware of, and mm -hmm. I think there was a, a background there, uh, done on this by some of the uh, mm -hmm. of our intelligence uh, officials uh, mm -hmm. who looked in, at and analyzed this data, um, mm -hmm. uh, what went into our analysis and our mm -hmm. uh, ultimate conclusion that uh, this was a chemical weapons attack that was carried out by the Syrian regime, uh, and uh, that was laid out, I think, in uh, 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 some articles the other day. Uh, they, they briefed on background, uh, given their status as uh, intelligence officials, but it's pretty clear cut in our book. Uh, look, that said, uh, as I think Secretary Tillerson said, uh, you know, there are, you know, we have the joint investigative mechanism, we have uh, other mechanisms, uh, the OPC, OPCW uh, um, uh, has these mechanisms to investigate, conduct an impartial investigation into these allegations. We know what happened. We have reached our own conclusion. We carried out the airstrikes. But right. by all means, uh, those uh, independent mechanisms should be allowed to carry out their investigations. But again, what we saw yesterday was, right. what did Russia do? It vetoed a UN Security Council resolution that would have allowed those investigations. There's before. a lot to go through uh, there. But you know, if let's say you have an investigation, and the investigation somehow, you know, um, this concludes that there was no Syria chemical strike. I mean, you already struck, you already destroyed that air base. So how would that, how would that be dealt with? I can only say that um, uh, we are, we, we undertook that uh, action with the utmost confidence uh, that it, this, that we were hitting the airstrip and the uh, air base rather that carried out that strike. And lastly, yep. I just want you to clarify something because I don't understand it. What is it that the U.S. Army, who was supposed to dispose of these chemical weapons, and in fact they did, they destroyed something like 600 tons, which is, you know, all the chemical weapons that was at least declared by Syria at the time. Isn't that true? Would you clarify that for us? Because you keep, or you keep hearing that Russia <coughs> was responsible to guarantee that uh, these weapons are destroyed or accounted for and so on. Right. Well, they were, in fact, um, you know, as signatories to that agreement, right. um, uh, Russia uh, pledged to assure that 
the Assad regime, and the Assad regime also pledged to ensure that it would uh, 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 give up its uh, declared chemical weapons. Uh, there were, uh, I don't have the, the exact amounts in front of me, but there was a massive amount of chemical weapons that were, in fact, uh, taken out of Syria and neutralized. Uh, so you can't say that that effort was in vain. It wasn't. It got mm -hmm. chemical weapons out of uh, that conflict area. Uh, but that said, clearly, either they remained their capacity to produce additional chemical weapons or they didn't declare all their chemical weapons. Yes, sir. To yesterday would have allowed an investigation. To, uh, my understanding was that the agreement back in that you just referred to that 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 allowed for investigations. So it, it, is it actually correct? Sorry, it sought, that, I'm, I apologize. It sought to hold the perpetrators of the chemical weapons attack accountable and called on the regime to cooperate with an independent international investigation. I apologize. Right, but an investigation. Uh, the the resol yesterday's resolution was not required for there to be an investigation. Right. These. I, right. My understanding is that these these bodies. I mean, that's what they exist for: is to carry out these re, re, these, so uh, these it investigations. Didn't, it didn't need. It didn't but need. They, it did you, not need. They don't to pass. They didn't need a new authorization to, from the Security Council to conduct an investigation. That's my understanding. Yeah. Go ahead, sir, and then I'll get to you. Uh, I have uh, a question about uh, yesterday's meeting in Moscow, yeah, sure. but in frame of Ukraine issue. So yesterday, Secretary of State said uh, in Moscow that he discussed Ukraine and Minsk agreement with Foreign Minister Lavrov. However, there was no acknowledgement uh, that Mr. Tillerson talked about it with Mr. Putin. So could you give more detail on that? And was the Ukraine issue raised during the meeting with Russian President? Uh, so I can, as you noted, I, I can say that uh, um, he did raise uh, uh, Ukraine in his bilateral meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. I don't have uh, uh, the, the details, full details of his uh, bilat with uh, uh, President Putin, or his meeting with President Putin. Uh, I, I can't confirm, I'm sorry, that, that, that Ukraine was raised in that setting. Uh, I, I, I think it probably was, uh, since they went through uh, the range of issues uh, where we uh, don't see eye to eye. Uh, uh, with uh, Russia on, um, and, uh, you know, Secretary Tillerson has been very clear that on those issues that we don't see eye to eye on, he'll continue to raise those uh, in his meetings with Russian officials. I just can't confirm absolutely that it was raised in that meeting. I just don't have that level of clarity. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Kind of a pivot. Uh, <laughs> Russia's hosting multi-nation consultations on Afghanistan oh, sure, tomorrow. Yeah. What, if any, role will the U.S. play in those talks, and is there concern that through those talks Russia is trying to expand its role and influence in Afghanistan? Uh, good question. So, first of all, we don't plan to participate in these uh, regional talks. Uh, I think they're April 14th, uh, which is tomorrow. Um, they have been organized by the Russian government. Um, we do generally support regional efforts uh, that um, work with the Afghan government uh, to build support for a peaceful outcome in Afghanistan. Um, and I think we, going forward, we do plan to uh, work with Russia and other key regional stakeholders uh, to enhance dialogue on Afghanistan. Um, it's been long been our argument uh, that uh, all countries in the region need to form a unified front with respect to uh, uh, Afghanistan and make it very clear that the um, the only way to end that conflict definitively is uh, through peace talks between uh, the Taliban and the Afghan government. Uh, and uh, we've said it also made it perfectly clear uh, that Taliban have no viable alternative but to enter into direct talks uh, in order to achieve their goals. Um, I think just to end it, uh, we just um, we just felt that these talks, um, it was unclear to us what the, uh, uh, what the purpose was. Um, it seemed to be a unilateral Russian attempt to assert influence in the region uh, that we felt wasn't constructive at this time. Uh, just follow on thank you. Follow on Afghanistan. Yes, sir. As far as uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark. Of course. As far as the uh, U.S. bombings in Afghanistan is concerned, it's not a big surprise to the high-level uh, Afghan officials because they were here. Uh, advisor to the President of Afghanistan and also Foreign Minister of Afghanistan were here. 
and speaking with the reporters and also at the think tanks, what they were saying that the terrorism problem in <laughs> Afghanistan is being created by Af Pakistan. And all the terrorists are coming into Afghanistan and back and forth and back and forth because there is no, there is no uh, check, and check and balance and they are not uh, uh, holding them. My right. question is here that as far as this uh, uh, bombing uh, to, uh, to eliminate those uh, ISIS and uh, Taliban's, is this because of uh, those high level officials who also met somebody here at the State Department and also recently you just issued a travel warning to Pakistan? You, you, when you say this bombing, you're, I think you're referring to the bombing that took place just a few hours ago? Is that That's right. Yes, sir. Um, the mother of all bombs. The mother of all bombs. Yeah, White House. Uh, not um, just in no, the okay. I just wanted to make sure I was on that. Look, um, a couple points. One is I'll, I'll refer you to uh, what's already been said about uh, this airstrike that was taken, that took place in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I, I think it was aimed at a, a network of tunnels uh, that was being used by uh, uh, terrorist organizations. Um, um, I can't say that this was uh, an immediate outcome of any conversations we had with uh, the Afghan government. I think it's part of our ongoing efforts to uh, take the fight to uh, the Taliban, to take the fight to uh, ISIS affiliates uh, that are operating in that territory, Al Qaeda affiliates that are operating uh, on Afghan soil, and that's going to continue. Um, you spoke about Pakistan and their role in this. Uh, we've been very clear. Uh, while we understand that Pakistan has made efforts uh, to confront terrorism and terrorist organizations on its own soil, uh, that there are still uh, what we call safe havens uh, that exist for terrorist groups to um, uh, operate from and carry strikes out uh, on Afghanistan. That's a problem. Uh, again, it's in uh, Pakistan's interest to uh, work with, uh, constructively with Afghanistan to address uh, those security concerns. Can yeah. I have one on India, please? Uh, I'll get back to you, I promise. Okay. Michelle, you. go ahead. I have a question on Turkey um, yep. and the Pastor Brunson case. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just get to her and then I promise okay. I'll come back to you. Sorry. Vice President Pence has written a letter to the family talking about how this is a top priority for the Trump administration, so I'm wondering what um, specifically the U.S. is doing to win his release, and then I have a follow-up. Sure. Um, you're talking about... Um, Andrew Brunson. Yeah, of course. Um, So um, we can confirm uh, that Turkish authorities detained uh, Andrew Brunson uh, on uh, October 7th, uh, 2016. Um, since his arrest, I can tell you that consular officers uh, have been able to visit him regularly. Uh, we continue to provide appropriate support, uh, consular services, uh, to both to Mr. Brunson as well as his family. Uh, goes without saying that we take very seriously uh, um, our obligation to assist uh, any U.S. citizen, but certainly in this case, uh, who, is, who are arrested abroad. Um, uh, with respect to his legal case, uh, I'd have to refer you to uh, Mr. Brunson's uh, uh, attorney. So the, the, um, when Tillerson was in Ankara, he was asked, and Chavasolo, the foreign minister, was asked about it, and he said that we're about to finalize the charges against him. And I wonder if there's been any movement in that case. I mean, as you say, he's been held since October. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, well, we have asked uh, Turkish officials uh, to consider releasing Mr. Brunson uh, from custody uh, subject to whatever judicial uh, conditions or controls that may be appropriate uh, while his legal case is resolved. Uh, I agree he's been in detention far too long. Um, and this has been done with other individuals under investigation. Um, and, of course, we call on Turkish authorities to resolve his case in a timely and fair manner, uh, respecting human rights uh, and fundamental freedoms, including the protections uh, of a fair trial guarantee uh, that are necessary for his defense. Uh, so our position in this is that we've made clear uh, our concerns to the Turkish government. Uh, we're going to continue to offer whatever support we can uh, to Mr. Brunson and his family. Um, and, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, our uh, uh, desires to see this uh, resolved as uh, quickly as possible. Sure thing. Let's stay on Turkey, and then we'll get back to Syria because sure. I know TJ is looking at me. Sure. On Turkey, just today, 
uh, UN experts uh, issued a report regarding referendum on Sunday, and they concluded that uh, if the constitution amendments pass uh, on Sunday, there will be uh, existing major violations of social and cultural rights in Turkey will even increase. And not only UN, but also EU, other international watchdogs, Venice commissions, and many other <coughs> experts basically conclude the same if the uh, constitutional changes pass uh, Turkey's democratic standards, uh, separation of powers, and many other values will be basically wiped out. What is your conclusion? Uh, I am sure you have seen <coughs> the proposal so far. <coughs> The proposals of, I'm sorry. Proposal of the uh, uh, constitutional changes that will be voted. I, I, look, I just say we're, we're obviously following this issue very closely. Uh, as I said the other day, we are concerned about uh, um, the quality of uh, Turkey's democracy. Um, these are discussions that we have uh, on a somewhat regular, regular basis uh, with uh, uh, the Turkish government. Um, because we're strong allies and partners, we can have those kinds of conversations. Um, I, I don't think I have much to, much, uh, to say beyond uh, uh, what I said the other day, which is that, uh, you know, we're, um, uh, you spoke about the OSCE's uh, final report. Uh, we're looking at that and studying it very closely, but, uh, you know, we're going to obviously watch this very closely and as it moves forward, the referendum, and um, uh, hope that uh, it's carried out in such a way that uh, guarantees uh, and strengthens uh, democracy in Turkey. But so far, the standards and the conditions already, uh, uh, don't you think the fairness of the freedom of the elections already under uh, huge questions uh, since we have seen the severe limitations on the campaigning uh, in Turkey? Several limitations? Severe limitations. Limitations. Okay. I mean, look, we never want to see, in any case, uh, as part of any kind of free and fair uh, electoral process, any kind of limitation on uh, on the uh, on the all sides to express their uh, viewpoints uh, peacefully. Um, uh, so, again, we're watching this very closely. In the back, and then. Uh, and aren't you concerned uh, about the environment in which the referendum is going to be held? I mean, hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, dissidents, including the leader of the uh, main uh, Kurdish opposition party, are in prison. How can they campaign for the no uh, voters? I mean, is, 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 is this referendum not going to be really a fair referendum, according to the United States? Well, again, I, I you know. Um, there are uh, um, election uh, observers on the ground. Um, we're going to let them uh, look at and analyze uh, this referendum as it, and that's going to include in the lead up to it, um, and pronounce their um, <coughs> judgment of whether uh, it was free and fair. Um, I'm going to withhold comment beyond what I have said already, which is, uh, you know, of course, uh, we're watching this, we're monitoring it very closely. Uh, sure, but let me, let me, I'll get back to you, I promise. I'm just in the middle there. Sorry. You? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to go to Asia. Um, so we can go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, not too long ago, Prime Minister Abe said that North Korea may have the capacity to deliver missiles with sarin nerve gas. I know Sarah Nerve Gas is in the news a lot recently. So first, I want to ask, do you agree with that assessment? And then I have a follow-up. Uh, you know what? I, I, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, I have not seen uh, those reports. Um, uh, obviously, uh, we're concerned about uh, North Korea's uh, pursuit of uh, uh, nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver those nuclear weapons uh, in the region and even to the United States. And that continues to be a major concern or a primary concern, but, excuse me, <coughs> um, uh, it also goes without saying that uh, uh, North Korea has shown itself uh, willing to pursue other uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so um, I, I, I can't say whether those reports are valid or not. 
I just don't know, uh, but it's something we would take very seriously. And then, um, so then just the other day as well, Sean Spicer said that um, there's no evidence that North Korea has the capacity of a nuclear strike at this time. And of course, a lot of eyes are on the country this weekend um, because of the holiday. So it, are you saying that either both with sarin gas and nuclear weapons, like the country doesn't have capacity for either? Or, well, they're clearly or, uh, pursuing ballistic missile testing. They're clearly trying to, I mean, we've seen this multiple times that they're, you know, in the, in the past six months alone, that they're trying to uh, test out systems uh, that can deliver uh, whatever, uh, whether it's a, a nuclear weapon or something else uh, in the region. And that's why, frankly, we are uh, so utterly seized with the threat that North Korea now poses. And it's also one of the reasons why, and this was made very clear in President's uh, meetings with uh, Chinese uh, leadership last week, uh, that, uh, you know, um, uh, the time for action is now. Uh, and by that, uh, we need to look at ways to put uh, increased pressure on North Korea uh, in order for it to recognize the reality that uh, it needs to pursue uh, denuclearization, that it needs to answer uh, the international community's very real concerns about uh, its ongoing efforts to uh, pursue nuclear uh, weaponry and the, and the means to deliver those in the region. We're going to stay in North Korea, sure. Yeah. Let's kill, on, on let's go through all these questions and then um, yes, no, kill this topic. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the last time uh, Secretary Tillerson said that uh, the strategic uh, patience is over and need a new approach to the North Korea. What is the United States uh, new approach toward the North Korea? What specifically included? Well, um, good question. I think that, you know, as I just said, provocations from North Korea have grown, frankly, too uh, common, too dangerous to ignore anymore. Um, so, uh, we're working with the international community, and that includes our partners in the region, uh, certainly uh, 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 Republic of Korea, uh, Japan uh, are among those stalwart partners and allies who we're working with uh, to address this concern. Um, but we're looking at how we hold the Kim Jong-un regime accountable uh, for its reckless behavior. Um, uh, and the way we're doing that is pursuing right now uh, efforts to isolate, to cut off uh, North Korea uh, from the rest of the world, and that's being done through diplomatic uh, efforts, but it's also through security and economic measures as well. Um, all of this is with the aim of uh, persuading North Korea that uh, its pursuit of nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them is only going to uh, uh, take it farther from what it professes to want, which is a prosperous, engaged uh, role in the world. Please. Well, I think there, there, there's been some, there's been lots of talk, and uh, North Korea wants to be. lots of discussion within the six party uh, 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 talks that, that they want, sorry, I'm answering two questions at one time, that they want um, uh, prosperity, that they want uh, to be heard. That's what I'm talking about. What do you yeah. mean by saying it's too dangerous to ignore anymore? Is this administration's position that the previous administration and the ones before it ignored North Korea? I think it's a – no, but I would say that there's – look, I think in the past several months, we have seen only an acceleration of North Korea's efforts to, as I said, to – uh, to pursue nuclear weaponry, but also the means to deliver it. So I think there's a realization that uh, the time for talk, the time for, the, you know, some of this, if I could put it in this kind of uh, long-term negotiation strategy and engagement is past. Well, it's uh, we, a we, freezing line, isn't it, to say that, like, it's too dangerous to ignore anymore. But, like, you know, it's one <coughs> thing, as the Secretary has said, that the policy of you know, strategic patience or such has failed. But that doesn't mean that previous administrations, whether it's the Clinton administration, Bush administration, or Obama administration, ignored the problem. They just didn't deal with it in a way that has been able to abate it, wouldn't you say? I would say that um, the... Are you saying that strategic patience is akin to ignoring? 
in no. ninth grade. No, and, and that's a fair point. What I would say is that we can no longer, I think, um, engage in that kind of longer range approach to North Korea, that we need uh, short-term solutions. And, you know, that's not to, you know, look, the Secretary is also very clear we're not looking to for regime change here. Well, do you need short-term solutions or do you need, I understand, it sounds like you're mixing your metaphors a little because, yes, you need, I understand what you're saying about not looking well, about people do. for a long-term, you know, thinking about long-term negotiations, but a short-term solution is not going to deal with the North Korean problem in the long term. <laughs> short-term solution is a short-term solution. Uh, look, um, let me try You that. don't want to curb the, y right. are you, you know, so, that's just. Okay. So I, I, there is an urgency to the situation that wasn't necessarily there in the past um, because of, you know, the actions that they've taken over the past six months. And so uh, I think that's been made very clear by Secretary Tillerson, by President uh, um, uh, Trump, uh, and we've made that clear to the Chinese as well. As are, well as our other allies and partners in the region. But, uh, the President Trump said that uh, if China is not have to resolve North Korean nuclear issues, the United States will take it, its own actions. What do you expect from China <coughs> to do so? Well, I think we expect China to obviously to. Uh, um, uh, assert its leverage that it has. It, you know, uh, um, I think just today it was talking about, uh, even though it's um, enacted all of the uh, UN Security Council resolutions, uh, uh, or UN Security Council uh, sanctions, rather, uh, regime against uh, North Korea, it's also got a very robust uh, trading program with North Korea. So clearly, it has economic influence uh, over North Korea. We're looking at it to leverage its unique relationship with North Korea. Uh, to persuade the regime in, in Pyongyang to uh, uh, reconsider. So I'll get back to you time. Um, there is an internal memo that went around, as well as something that was put, updated online, that um, even though the OMB uh, lifted the f hiring freeze, uh, the federal hiring freeze, that uh, um, that the secretary uh, to listen, <coughs> that the State Department is going to maintain its its hiring freeze. Do you know what led to that um, decision? Sure. Um, so OMB on okay. Um, so the OMB on Wednesday announced the lifting of the hiring freeze, as you noted, and provided also extensive further guidance to uh, all the various federal agencies on the implementation of and requirements uh, pursuant to the OMB memorandum, uh, which is called a comprehensive uh, plan for reforming the federal uh, government and reducing the federal civilian workforce, which is a mouthful. Apologize. Yeah. Um, and this. Document this memo provides guidance on new requirements um, on the presidential memorandum that was initially issued on January 23rd. This is the one that issued the hiring freeze, um, as well as the executive order uh, issued on March 13th uh, that required a comprehensive plan uh, to reorganize uh, all the executive branch uh, departments and agencies. So, as part of that process, uh, the department and the secretary. Uh, are going to be undertaking and reorganization later in the year, and uh, the decision was taken uh, that the hiring freeze will continue until that plan is fully developed and agreement is reached on its implementation. And this is just part of prudent planning. We can't be onboarding people when we don't know uh, what our reorganization is ultimately going to look at look like. But until then, and this is an important point, the secretary does retain authority to waive the rolling or the hiring freeze. Uh, and we'll do so in instances where national security interests and the department's core mission responsibilities require. So, so it does, doesn't break any federal law that he's done this? It does not. It's his, his decision to, uh, to even though that this hiring Even though the Congress has uh, appropriations has approved money for it, or, or even, even if uh, the <coughs> Congress has said that that's fine to lift it. So there, there is a law, a federal law, that you know, that if appropriations has has moved on some kind of spending or whatever, right. and, and he says, no, I'm not going to touch that, isn't that against the law? My understanding is that he has the um, uh, jurisdiction to uh, basically to uh, keep this freeze in place as we uh, go about this presidentially mandated uh, reorganization. Are we talking about civil and foreign service officers, political appointees? Across what? the board. So he's, wait a minute. So he's not going to hire any political appointees 
Uh, I, Before I, the reorg, I believe it's a hiring freeze across the board. Could you check on that? So what do you? Yeah, I, I mean, that. that would essentially, if that's true, what you're saying that th that there's a hiring freeze across the board, that you would not be hiring I mean, any assistant secretaries, sure under secretaries, yeah, a deputy sure secretary of state. That can't be right. Yeah, so so that. effectively, he's put this on the freeze until he's done the reorganization. Have those plans actually started and? How are they going to be fleshed out? Does uh, I, I believe they have started. Um, I, as to how they're going to be fleshed out, I, I don't have I mean, any more details. Uh, it's going to go on for the, the rest of the year. Uh, I I don't know if there's a time date. Um, uh, I I don't have any kind of time frame for you. If I and I, I, I gather that he would have got uh, White House or congressional approval for this. Uh, yes, I would imagine. He I, would. I just want to point out something On the that political point is that's a good question. Though. Yeah, no, because I mean, former yeah. Minister Lavrov even said yesterday that I mean, and I mean, we can consider the source, but other diplomats from other no, no, I'm not responding. I'm just I understand, but other diplomats from other countries have also said that the lack of staff at the State Department has become a pedi impediment to having interlocutors to deal with whether it's long-term foreign policy cooperation, short-term foreign policy crises. So, I mean, I would really like some clarification on that, because if you're saying that there's a hiring freeze across the board, I really would say that suggests that that would continue to be a problem. It's a fair question. Uh, well, related, related to this, though, Mark, you said that he has the he, – he retains authority to yeah, waive sorry, it, thank you. right? Yes, he does. Yeah, uh, in instances where national security interests and department's core mission responsibilities, I would assume that political appointees think, in high think, positions would fall would under department's the, core mission responsibilities. Do you think that would apply to the newly nominated deputy? I would. You think, think he'd get a waiver? Apply. So okay. hold on a second. I'm not done. Yeah, yeah. Back in February, two months ago tomorrow, the department sought and received a waiver from the, the what was then the hiring freeze. You were given permission by OMB to bring on 175 new staff, 70 entry-level, 80 mid-level, and 25 consular fellows. Did those people actually come on board? And has the department, did the department seek additional exemptions between February 14th and I'll check on both. Wednesday? Yeah, I'll check on both. I'll yeah. take those questions. Uh, yeah, we can change the subject, but I haven't gotten this. I'll get back to you, I swear to gosh. Regarding Venezuela, sure. thousands of protesters are uh, demanding new elections in Venezuela. And uh, opposition leaders uh, consider that the government of the President Nicolás Maduro is no longer respecting democratic institutions and it's sliding toward authoritarian practices. Uh, could you comment on that, please? Sure. Um, First of all, we're, we, I, I want to start with some of the uh, um, reports of violence against protesters during demonstrations in Venezuela. Um, uh, we're aware of those reports. Uh, we obviously regret any loss of life. We call uh, once again on the government of Venezuela to conduct full, fair, and transparent investigations into this violence. Um, we also uh, call on the government and uh, security forces to respect uh, the freedom of assembly, uh, peaceful assembly. Uh, as, as a universal human right, uh, which the Venezuelan authorities uh, should respect. Uh, we, as I said, also urge the demonstrators to express themselves nonviolently. Um, uh, with respect to your broader question, uh, we urge the Maduro government to uh, uh, reconsider its decision this uh, past uh, week, I believe, or past weekend, uh, to bar uh, um, uh, Miranda State Governor uh, Enrique uh, Capriles uh, and uh, uh, from participating in the country's public life for, uh, I think, uh, some 15 years. Uh, it's something we view with grave concern. Um, uh, it's absolutely vital uh, uh, that Venezuelans have the right to uh, exercise their uh, and elect their representatives in free and fair elections in, accord with, in accordance with the Venezuelan Constitution and consistent with international instruments, and that includes the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Um, uh, we firmly support as well the consensus of the Organization of American States Permanent Council, which affirms <coughs> it is essential that the government of Venezuela uh, ensure the full restoration of democratic order. Thanks. Please. Yes. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned the need to work with uh, South Korea and Japan uh, on yes. North Korea. Uh, and Vice President Pence is about to travel to that region yep. and uh, will be visiting both South Korea and Japan. I was wondering if you could discuss uh, what message he'll be sending to um, leaders in the region and what he'll be discussing in those meetings. And well, look, I, I, I would have to refer you to the, the uh, Vice President uh, and his office uh, to talk about the specifics about his trip. But obviously, um, I think that it's very clear, uh, given uh, Secretary Tillerson's travel to the region, uh, given that uh, uh, both uh, that leadership from uh, 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 Republic of Korea and Japan have been here for high-level meetings uh, um, that we are very concerned, uh, primarily concerned with uh, North Korea uh, and its actions and how to deal with North Korea. And in that regard, I think he's going to be sending a very clear message, uh, certainly uh, in Seoul and, uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, of our uh, steadfast <coughs> ironclad support uh, for our allies and partners in the region. Uh, and. Uh, that stands absolute. Um, so I'll, let, I'll leave it to him to speak in more, greater detail. Okay. And then also yeah. in uh, so Japan, a uh, he'll. Questions about um, Syria? Of course. Um, so uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov talked about, you know, he offered to reinstate this deconfliction um, channel. Um, and uh, but but there were terms, and I was wondering, um, you know, the, this thing about uh, the, de the deconfliction in the air in the air between airplanes and, and uh, that was suspended. Um, and uh, Secretary uh, Tillerson didn't uh, say anything about whether he accepted the terms that Lavrov set. So we're wondering, you know, where does that stand? Um, how important is that channel? And uh, what's the plan when it comes to preventing any mishaps in the air over Syria? Uh, frankly, my, my uh, understanding was uh, that that does remain intact. There was some question that, that it was going to be pulled down. That was a, a Russian uh, claim, at least. Um, look, we consider that deconfliction channel to be uh, very important uh, because it helps uh, ensure that uh, neither our, our pilots uh, nor uh, Russia's pilots are uh, unduly or unnecessarily uh, put in harm's way uh, when we're carrying out uh, um, uh, uh, military missions in the uh, in that region. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can't speak to um, how it may change. My understanding is that it does remain in, in effect. Because I mean, was my understanding is that that channel was was suspended um, after the missile strike. I, I had heard that. I had seen those same reports. But my understanding was that my understanding is that after that it was reinstated. That's incorrect. I'll let you know. I, know. I have, yeah, an, I have a follow up question. Yeah. Of course, finish up. Um, yeah, so um, did uh, Secretary Tillerson meet with any members of civil society when he was, while he was in Moscow or in Russia? Uh, I don't believe he did. Uh, frankly, it was an issue of time. Um, uh, he did, of course, uh, raise uh, our concerns, as he does uh, in every meeting uh, uh, with our Russian counterparts. Um, uh, but. Uh, uh, I don't believe he actually had the, the time uh, to meet with any members of civil society while he was on the ground. Just to follow up on that, and then I have a Please. question on Afghanistan. Do you anticipate this is something that he'll make as a kind of regular feature of his travel? I mean, you know, past secretaries to some extent, some more, some less, have, have made that a kind of staple of their... Meeting with civil society uh, members? Yeah. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's, it, it has been because it's a it's a great way to send the message that, you know, it, it's a matter of concern, it's an issue of concern uh, to us. Uh, again, I think in, in any given visit, uh, given the other demands on, on Secretary's schedule, of course, I, I can't speak categorically, but I know for a fact that he does consider uh, human rights, healthy civil society to be uh, something that he's going to press uh, in all of his uh, interactions. Um, I have a question, yes, if we could just go back to Afghanistan for a second. Yeah, sure. Um, I know you kind of punted to the Pentagon on the actual strike itself, but you know we haven't really heard a lot about ISIS in the kind of Afghan Pakistan region, um, and I'm wondering if you could kind of bring us up to date on, you know, your discussions with those governments um, about the growth of ISIS, because like sure. I said, we really haven't. I mean, I know that they've you know had some small <coughs> presence, but it it kind of was surprising to see the depth of which the concern. Right. Which you have the well, and, and, and it's a fair point to bring up. I mean, look, we've been very clear that 
uh, just like we've seen elsewhere in the world, but certainly in Afghanistan where ISIS has attempted to um, uh, co-opt uh, some existing groups on the ground uh, in an effort to, you know, create affiliates. And we're going to see this, I think, uh, uh, and this is something that was discussed in the uh, ministerial a few weeks ago, that as ISIS continues to get pressed uh, in Syria and Iraq, uh, it's going to seek to do that, I think, more and more. So it's something we're watching very closely, and we're working with the government of Afghanistan and our partners in the region uh, in order to deny uh, 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 any terrorist organization that includes Al Qaeda as well um, safe haven or any kind of material support on the ground. Um, and as we've also been very clear, we're, when we see targets of opportunity and, uh, and leadership uh, opportunities to take out key leadership, we're going to take those opportunities. I understand that this was a target of opportunity, but are you saying that this target was, you know, were they working with other types of affiliate, like so-called affiliates? That's and a common practice for ISIS. No, I, yeah. no, I understand, yeah. but yeah. I'm just saying. I don't know the specifics. I don't have enough specifics on I'm this. I'm just you know, as opposed yeah. to like the actual strike and the weapon and how it was done, I'm interested in this particular target and right. why it was chosen in terms of their, you know, threat. And given that the State Department has really been the lead in terms of, you know, the coalition against ISIS, I'd be interested a little bit more in. Sure. I, I don't have a lot of detail on this particular strike and, and why this, I mean, other than that, they were ISIS affiliated uh, group. Uh, ISIS or affiliated or ISIS or members of ISIS, like I'll check. official leadership. I'll check. Thank you. Yep. A couple more questions, guys. Uh, okay. T. Gender, I haven't yeah. gotten to you yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a lot of patience, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, wishing you a quick, fast oh, recovery thanks. because Thank I you. saw you limping. <laughs> it's I'm <coughs> limping. I'm coughing. Oh yes. I need vacation. Luckily, it's coming up. Yeah, I have empathy. I'm coughing also. Yeah. Uh, the one short follow-up on Afghanistan and then one on uh, India related. In Afghanistan is that uh, day before yesterday after the briefing in the Pentagon, the um, defense secretary, when I asked uh, him that is Afghanistan on back burner, he said not <coughs> at all. Nothing has changed. So that's from the defense on the, what he said, on, yes. on, the, <laughs> on the diplomatic side with the Russia taking that initiative, has anything changed from this side on the diplomatic front? Not at all. In fact, uh, you know, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, the Afghan foreign minister, I think it was in conjunction with the uh, uh, counter-ISIS uh, ministerial, was here in town, and they had a very good uh, bilateral uh, discussion. It was one of the few bilateral meetings he was able to take, given his uh, schedule, Secretary Tillerson's schedule. Uh, but he made the point of taking that meeting because he wanted to express our firm support for uh, the Afghan government's uh, continued efforts to uh, confront the Taliban, to confront other terrorist groups on its uh, territory, and to, uh, you know, solidify uh, and continue to enact needed uh, political and economic reforms. And the other one, you had another one? Yep, finish I have a and second one. one. The second okay. one is about oh, you, uh, Three more questions, Jerry. Yeah, I got to you. I got second, to you already. The second three one is, questions. the second one Please. is about um, the, the diplomatic efforts from the U.S. Uh, the Indian media is flush with this uh, hate crimes uh, against in, in people of Indian origin. Now, uh, what uh, the, uh, kind of journalistic investigation revealed that most of these uh, Indians were either misidentified or misunderstood because of religious symbols or other things. But when the Indian ambassador rushes to State Department and expresses his deep concerns about this, and then we find out that the Hardish Patel the county sheriff says that it was not a hate crime. So what, what, how can you clarify that these incidents sure. are not against Indians or people from Indian origin? They're misidentified. There's a, there is a, it's not about <coughs> condoning hate crime. It's about <coughs> misrepresenting the facts, if you can clarify from this. So uh, a couple of thoughts on this. First of all is, um, you know, we obviously uh, strongly condemn any uh, hate crime any crime carried out against uh, someone based on their ethnicity, uh, their sexual orientation, uh, whatever. Um, we condemn it. Uh, secondly, though, with respect to these particular crimes, uh, that's really something for either local, regional, or federal law enforcement to speak to. Uh, all of these crimes uh, need to be thoroughly investigated, uh, and that's why I'm very hesitant to comment on 
one particular case or not because I don't know the facts and it would be imprudent for me, uh, except to say that, you know, uh, largely speaking, you know, there are, there's a strong Indian American uh, community in this country. Um, you know, they're a vibrant part of uh, American culture uh, and society and uh, the economy here. Uh, and uh, we as Americans uh, welcome their contribution. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, any uh, crime based on, uh, that potentially based on someone's uh, ethnicity or, or heritage uh, should be heartily condemned. I was trying to clarify once. Sure, sure. I was just trying to clarify that this uh, crimes were even ethnicity based were not against the Indian ethnicity. They were mis. Uh, Identify. Uh, I just uh, don't have the details. I apologize, Chief Jenner. Uh, quick, quick say, question. Yeah, uh, very quick. On the yeah. Palestinian uh, yeah. Israeli issue. A couple of days ago, you issued a, an advisory, a travel advisory yeah. uh, to, to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, but you also urged uh, American citizens to leave Gaza. Yeah. And this coincided. You know, with the uh, <coughs> escalating me. tensions and you know, the Israelis are amassing troops, uh, and are you concerned that there may be a, there may be another another war that no, uh, I, I, may, I, sure, uh, I, I'm, aware, the I'm aware. I'm aware the that timing was right. uh, <laughs> was linked or was uh, was close to, but this was, uh, as my understanding, uh, just a periodic uh, update, um, uh, and that the information concerning Gaza was uh, similar to language from our previous travel warnings. Uh, so. As many of you know in this room, we have to periodically update uh, the language um, uh, to ensure they remain valid and up to date. Uh, this was a routine update. I think the previous one was uh, uh, issued on August 23rd, uh, 2016, but it contained very similar guidance. Um, you know, our travel warning warns U.S. citizens against all travel to the Gaza Strip and urges those present to depart as soon as possible when border crossings are open. And I think. In way of, by way of explanation, given the security uh, conditions in Gaza, uh, U.S. government personnel have uh, been long restricted from travel to Gaza, and so that restricts our ability to provide any assistance or support to any U.S. citizen uh, uh, in Gaza. So it's out of that um, reality, if you will, uh, that we uh, caution. Yep. And this, uh, and then John, last question. Yeah, and this uh, Russia hosted conference in Afghanistan. You said that yes, it seemed to be a unilateral Russian attempt to assert influence in the region. Uh, this this dropping of this massive bomb in Afghanistan that has a fairly large optical element to it. Uh, could you could one interpret that as a unilateral attempt to assert influence? No. In the uh, look, I, I, again, I'm I, I'm uh, I, I'm not going to attempt to. Uh, Speak uh, way outside my box and talk about you know uh, military matters. But it does uh, have when it's it. a bomb that large. There's a diplomatic effect to dropping something like that. <laughs> there is, John. But I imagine. But uh, I'm gonna stay mum on that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.